So Catherine, I think you were on the podcast. I should look up the podcast episode number so if people want to go back. I will and put that in the notes. But I think it was like years ago. And when we last talked, I, the the landscape of both the world and the psychedelic landscape was very different, actually. <laughs> yeah, everything was different. Everything in my life, too. You know, it, it's yeah. like everything changed in the last five years. Yeah, dramatically, uh, probably in your life, too, but also in, in some of this space. And I, if I remember correctly, you weren't you were an early arrival into psychedelic research. And I remember you feeling like you had been through a kind of journey with it. And you were already at a point where you're like, I need to get away from this for a while and not be a part of whatever this blooming is and this commercialization. Um, but you did write a book about it. And so on some level, here you are back. Like, How does it feel to be a little bit back in the mix? <laughs> <laughs> um, it feels mostly good. I have to say being a free agent and being able to make all of my own decisions and not be beholden to any of the powers that be feels yeah. great. Yeah. As I look, it's like, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of standing at the far outer reaches of this maelstrom. And I'm just kind of witnessing the storm and like, man, I'm so glad I'm not in the center of that because that's got to be pretty hard to navigate. Yeah. Well, what does it look like from the outside looking in at this point? I mean, you were so you were literally just so people know you were uh, at the early research at Johns Hopkins and sort of at the beginnings of a lot of this, whatever you want to call it, this new resurgence into the West. Uh, what's the vantage point for you now? To me, it looks like a lot of growing pains. And so far, I haven't seen... If you imagine like a horse race, I haven't seen that horse out in front yet that we anticipated, you know, four or five years ago. I remember, I think mm. you pitched it to me something like, um, well, what if you're wrong? Like, what if capitalism and commercialization and all of this is ultimately for good? I said, I said that. I'm, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound like me. I know. But I said, well, I'm actually happy to be wrong. I, I hope it works out for the benefit of more people. But I haven't seen that yet. And some of the more um, concerning things that I anticipated a number of years ago have kind of come to pass. And at the same time, I see a lot of really well-intentioned people trying to make psychedelics fit into a system that they're not designed for. So, you know, we're all trying our best. It's like making a beautiful piece of art and trying to sell it, you know, you end up either selling it for millions of dollars or nothing. Uh, yeah. I created this book that's, you know, 10 years of my life and two years of hard work. And, you know, I might sell a few thousand copies if I'm really successful, and that would be a big success. I'm not going to sell millions of copies. So it's interesting when art or spirituality interfaces with capitalism. And that's the part where I'm just <laughs> kind of seeing like, these are not, these systems are not designed to play together. <laughs> No, I, I wonder who said it, but I read it the other day. Someone was like, when you try to, uh, like, pin down the sacred or certainly commercialize the sacred, it often has a way of just like you can't pin it down, or it's like, yeah, that's not going to work out like that. Yeah, and you can try. You people try all the time, <laughs> all the time. It either becomes not sacred or the sacred things like, yeah, we're not going to let that happen that way. And right. the last couple of years. When all that money went into all these different psychedelic startups and enterprises and so forth, and uh, a lot of them, I think, were trying to do that in some way or another. And sure enough, it's just the, it's like a re reshuffling of things, which ultimately is good because, I mean, look, that's a way that you could say capitalism is serving this because it's like there was no business model. It's like, so it's, they're just like, well, then you can't do it it's not going to work out you're going to have to go back to something that actually makes sense like as an exchange and people want and they didn't want that that you couldn't scale it up like that that fast i know isn't it kind of adorable when capitalism is right and then proves our <laughs> point which is that it wasn't going to work it's like yeah, no it there's no the market system. for that sorry <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's all starting to, all that's going away yeah but i do what's interesting though is the interest hasn't gone away and um people using these tools hasn't gone away and not that maybe not that it ever 
was anywhere anyway in the first place. It's just more sort of in the mainstream conversation. Like anyone who's been in the underground, it's like this stuff's been everywhere. And of course, it's been in human history for so long that it, it's just more of like an accepted conversation from this diversion we took in the 70s in a sense where it was like, oh, that's bad stuff or we're not supposed to talk about that or all the misinformation that's out there. It's sort of a re-education in the mainstream happening. Yeah, uh, and I think that that part of what's happening, that dialogue is probably the best thing that will come out of a lot of that. If you think about the value of all of that investment, all of that money that poured into one version of success, I don't think that's going to work out, but that value is getting turned into a lot of people being able to finally ask questions, plan for their, you know, healthcare, their medical needs, their end of life. Um, I've had colleagues and even strangers, people I barely know feel safe asking me like, Hey, what do I do about the fact that I'm still traumatized from nine 11? Mm. Like, can you talk to me about the fact that I have to take anxiety medication all the time? And like, I'm like, I'm not a clinical psychologist, but they, they know about my book and they know what I've done. And suddenly I'm a person that has wisdom that people are not finding anywhere else. So in a way, I feel like those of us who have invested the time in psychedelics, um, we actually have our wisdom to offer, not just it's, you know, the, the chemicals or the substances, they are always going to figure out a way to find those. Yeah. But the people who really know what's going on, there aren't that many of us. And it's kind of nice to see regular people asking those questions. You know, they'll, they'll figure out how to get their hands on whatever they want to take. But then what are they going to do with that experience after they've had that, ex you know, had it? Do you think that's the, the missing pieces about the integration or the after? Or do you think it's also about the experience itself and the guidance of it? I mean, it's a great question. Um, I was just talking to, I've talked to a few scientists about this because there's this hyper clinical model now that's, they even have an acronym mm -hmm. now. It's called PAT. And I refuse to use that acronym because I'm like, I'm not going to not say psychedelic. I'm sorry. It's psychedelic assisted therapy. It's not PAT. It's not like right. a cute little like, oh, K acronym. That's like K-A-T. The, the, yeah. Ketamine. I hate it. Cat. Cat. Took no, me a while to figure out what people were talking about. It's like, I what, know. What cat? Is there a cat? I, it's like, oh, it's an acronym. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, no, let's not skip over the fact that we're saying these like, quote, bad words, like these taboo names. Like we need to say them actually, guys. We can't just like turn them into an acronym and move <laughs> on. So I'm concerned maybe about the hyperclinical model, just making it hard for people to integrate experiences that are that appear to be uh very spiritual the word psychotic is thrown around a lot by doctors and psychiatrists um experiences that there's nothing bad about an experience like that and any shaman or healer or psychonaut will tell you what appears to be psychotic or very confusing from the outside might be perfectly understandable from the inside of the experience so I think as long as people don't engage very much with the hyperclinical model, I think the experience is still a fairly safe thing to engage with. What I, what I maybe worry about is that after people have had the experience, we haven't gotten any better at providing support in community afterward. You know, you still have to go to see a therapist and who, I mean, my therapist, when I brought up psychedelics many years ago, she didn't even want to talk about them. She's like, why are we talking about this experience you had? <laughs> you know, we're here to do somatic therapy or whatever it was. Um, so I think that that gap is still quite significant. Like, what do people do on the Monday morning? How do they go back to work? How do they talk to their family? You know, like those questions mm. are still very, I think, unanswered. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And yet these experiences have a kind of intelligence in a way to affect change in people that is also hard to pin down. Like it has its own in unfolding. Here, an example, uh, Lama Sultram I just met recently and she's a- Oh, amazing. I just got turned on to her recently and I started listening to her teachings for the first time. Oh, cool. She was at the Ram Dass retreat. And so we got some actual good time and hang in and- really great uh, person and and she was t telling me uh she's like you know my son is a really really intense llama 
also. I was like, that's awesome. That's incredible. And she's like, well, he used to be in the sciences. And he's like, really into science. And that was his thing. And like, PhD, the whole bit. And he was in, and so he's doing that. And deep, and he had his first ayahuasca experience. And he's like, I discovered in ayahuasca that I'm supposed to be a llama. And I'm, all of this, I'm done. And they're ever, you know, it's the usual, like, I did ayahuasca. I'm getting the tattoo across my chest. I'm quitting my job. I'm divorcing. And I'm like, no, 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 time out. Take take three weeks, okay? <laughs> no tattoos right away. So I think they said that, like, well, that's beautiful, but, you know, you love science, and you've, you're really deep into this career. Pause a bit. And I think he did pause, but inevitably, maybe a year later or more or something like that, he did go back, have a second experience. And after, he's like, no, it's really clear to me. Anyway, as I gave away the punchline here, he did moved to a different thing and not only that she's like now he's he's way more strict llama than me i mean he's like wow. meditating like you know and that's his he's been and now he's doing it that's what he's been doing and so it's like i don't know what kind of integration he had and i just hear about other people and even for myself it's like it can be messy but it's also like there's it's almost like it awakens a kind of it shows you things and it's just about our own volition to say i want to follow that or i'm going to start leaning into that or not and it would be nice, yes, if we had a kind of support for that because making changes of any kind of your life is difficult inside the system we're in that is already so destabilizing. Like the world itself is changing so much. So sort of like what the hell are we standing on? And even like careers we might have or dreams we might have or even if it's as simple as mundane as like home ownership. It's like that's never going to happen for me. Or all these things that are just like going away. And and that in itself is a kind of change of society and the earth. But Anyway, I had a question for you. I saw this little line. You had one little sentence in here, and I marked it because I was like, what, what are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> you talk, Oh, by the way, I'm sorry to hear about Roland. I know. Uh, I don't know if, how close you are, but I know he's very ill. And uh, just for someone that was close to you, uh, sorry to hear that. Yeah. I will just say very briefly about Roland. When I saw him a year ago, um, yeah. I drove all the way down to Baltimore because I had heard from a mutual friend that he might be very sick or unpredictably sick. And we spent six, seven hours just talking at his house. The, the, oh, the time flew by and I felt a kind of closure with that relationship where I was like, oh, we have moved on from where things left off when I left Hopkins. And now, thank God, I can just be with him as a friend without the power dynamics, without the little disagreements about how to do the research, all of that yeah. stuff. And I felt that maybe me leaving, that was one of the gifts I got, was that I got to have that relationship with him before he died. So for me, it just felt perfect that even that instinct I had to leave even though I spent less time with this person over the last 10 years, what I got was this beautiful ending of that relationship, mm. that that's what I can now remember. I, I can forget all the stuff that happened in the beginning. And there's actually a psychologist who studies this. And my friend reminded me recently that how things end is way more important than how they begin or what the middle looks like. So you remember the end. Oh, that gives me chills. I'm so happy to hear that you had that, you know, because I was reading this and it's like, I wonder where it's now. And, and that's, that's really heartwarming. Did, I mean, not to speak for him, but did you feel like his journey in his, you know, seeming like where he came from and all that stuff he went through with this whole rise. And then it's been a while now and where he's at now. I've heard a few interviews of his, uh, where he was speaking this last year and it seems like he has been on a journey, but still really believed in it. I don't know. Yeah, Is there anything you I might think, like to share? I well, so I think very similar to when my sister died, it was like it all just kind of became clear to me that how you die really matters and how I wanted to die was not at the end of a long research career, very stressed out, having spent most of my waking hours like arguing over, you know, tiny little details or like, you know, trying to get money from rich people to do the science I cared about, but never getting to really ask the right questions and just always kind of missing the mark. 
And I think for Roland, he actually thrived in that relationship with the science, with the institution, mm -hmm. with the participants. So I remember telling him a year ago, I was like, you know, you can stop working at any time. And he's like, why would I? I love what I do. I love mm -hmm. this. And in a way, it's like he got to do what he loved. And then that final year of advocacy and raising money for Hopkins and educating so many people on such a public stage was just like the cherry on top of this Sunday. But like, he actually loved the Sunday. He loved all of yeah. the years of hard work. He liked the game. Yeah. Yes. And he yeah. was good at it. Right. So yeah. I think I also got to kind of appreciate that part of him. And still I was cheering him on that. Like he got this final year that looked more like, you know, the thing that I was searching for when I left. Like I mm. wanted a fulfilling life. And so he got all of it. And I just, when you have a life like that, that's so fulfilled and the person has gotten to do everything they've wanted to do, you know, there's even nothing to be sad about, yeah. right? It's like such a perfect life. Like what an amazing gift. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it says here, well, there's two, actually two interesting things in this. One of them is quite silly. Is it true you drove around in a yellow Lotus sports car with him? You just threw that in. And I'm like, that cracks me up. I know. R I did that on purpose because <laughs> I knew that he, and we joked about this. So when I talked to him this summer on the phone, um, he said, you know, people want me to be like some kind of saint now. They, they think I'm a saint. I'm like, don't worry. I'm going to make sure that they don't think of you that way. Awesome. I'm going to make sure they remember the Lotus sports car and like yeah, that yeah. you were just a human being who liked cool things like buying a sports car because you finally got a job that paid you well, you know, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I like that. I loved, I had an instant image in my head of that <laughs> little scene happening. I get the same things. A lot of projection out there. People think I'm, not that it's better or worse to be a vegan, but they think I'm vegan and I don't drink beer and it's like I'm meditating all day and I'm like, oh, geez, boy. I'm a, I got a lot of problems with me. <laughs> you have no idea. Uh, but it says here that you were playing a song for him, some Lady Gaga song, but you were trying to pitch a new study about music and psychedelics and awe. That's it. And I'm like, ooh, ooh, tell me more. Um, I knew that you would be into that part. Yeah. That so, caught me. So the, um, you, Fred Barrett, who just took over as director in, at yeah. the Psychedelic Center, he was one of the reasons that he got recruited to Hopkins as a postdoc was because he had been studying music and the brain. And I knew him and his mentor at UC Davis. Hmm. So when we started our meditation study at UC Davis, Fred Barrett started as a postdoc, maybe the year or maybe two years after I started to work with um, a fellow named Peter Janata. And you wouldn't think this, right? But meditation, music, consciousness, all of this stuff was so stigmatized. Like why on earth would you study people having full life experiences? You know, we need to compartmentalize the science. But UC Davis at that time really wanted to take on these big questions. And so music was one of them, emotions, uh, spirituality. And when Fred came to join us, there was this brief glimmer of hope for me where I was like, maybe we can really do here at Hopkins what we did at UC Davis, but like the consciousness piece, the neuroscience piece and the psychedelic piece. And it can be this like world-class uh, center for not just understanding. I always hated that term drugs of abuse. I hate that term, you know, or like drug research. It's like, no, this is about the human experience. Like the yeah, chemicals yeah. are just a way to get at that. So anyway, one of the things I became obsessed with that final year at Hopkins was if you're playing a song for someone and they can tell you if they're experiencing different emotions, that part is pretty easy, but you can actually physiologically measure how much awe they are experiencing by whether they're the hair on their arms raises emotional up emotional response right yes is that what and, it's called? yeah and there's a term for that and you can measure it and there was another guy i think in virginia who was studying that piece so i had this it was like one of those beautiful mind moments john nash like i had the whole like you know yeah. plan up on the board and ultimately we kept studying meditators because that was roland's interest it was also where the funding was at the time but i'm still rooting for fred like i want him to like realize that vision with the music yeah. and awe and these like really hard to pin down emotions, but grounded in the science. Yes. So he's well, going to do it. Don't worry. I'd love I to believe meet in Fred. him. 
Yeah, that sounds so cool because um, another layer to this is so Robin, who is in your book, Robin Carhart Harris, and Leor. I just met Leor, and I'm oh, stopping the same Leor in yes. London. Um, uh, I'm working on a project with Robin at UCSF now, which involves music and nature images from Louis Schwartzberg, and it's measuring awe. Oh, and, awesome. And I don't really know what they're going to be doing on the research side of things, but I'm like, when I saw that, I was like, this is a lot of crossover. And so I, right. I definitely and wanted so to know more. There's also the piece where, um, of all of the research I did, the thing that people remember is this mystical questionnaire, the mystical experience questionnaire. It's been translated into tons of languages. Fred and I and Roland, we're getting emails like every week. Someone from Japan wants to translate it into Japanese. Someone from Germany wants to, you know, so it really took off. But meanwhile, my openness finding is the thing that I felt was the ticket to so many research topics. And so awe and openness are also correlated. Mm. Awe and openness are also connected to being able to be, um, hypnotized. So high absorption is connected with both awe and openness. So all of these Whoa. things, I think, point to why psychedelics interact with both openness and awe, because you're experiencing complete absorption, probably for the first time in your life, if you're a Westerner. Like some of us get lucky and have like a flow state while we're playing sports, but otherwise, you know, we're not going to the opera and experiencing this transcendent kind of emotion related mm -hmm. to a stimulus from the outside. Okay. So openness and awe, like, can we, are, do you see these as just different? Or how would you define those a little bit? When you're saying openness, like your ability, you, like you feel very open, sort of receptivity to ideas and feelings, or what are you saying? Well, openness as a personality trait would be mm -hmm. how much in your regular life, day to day, you tend to uh, be interested in novelty new experiences, you're willing to try new things, even if they're, you know, risky. Yeah. Um, you're able to take on different perspectives and other people's uh, theory of mind. So it's connected to empathy. Um, it's like the classic hippie mantra. Yeah, it's going to say, what's the other polarity? Is it just crusty or Republican? No, I'm kidding. No, what it is, is um, it's that you are you are rigid, but you actually thrive when things are predictable and ah. familiar and routine. I see. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to not be very open. It just depends on what your environment is, what your culture values, right. what your job is. Um, the kind of openness that I experience on a daily basis is would be very antithetical to a lot of jobs out there. Like I would yeah. go psychotic if I had to, you know, be in a corporate office job taking instructions from a boss every day and clocking in, clocking out. That would drive me nuts. And believe me, I tried it for a few months in high school and I was like, this is hell. That's absolute hell. But for someone who likes that kind of routine, they could really thrive there. So right. I think what psychedelics do is they take people beyond our culture's comfort zone for openness and for these transcendent kind of experiences. So our culture is not set up to allow that to happen. We want to keep people in a certain container. But if you're in Nepal, and you're a young kid and you have a transcendent experience, well, you can join a monastery. You can walk around the Buddha stupa every day. You can, you know, there are options that does that mean you don't have to leave your family. You don't have to go to another country and like start over. In America, I mean, you know, the options are few and far between. You either become an artist, a musician, maybe a writer, or you just or you an know, influencer. No. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it's a, a new, new option, option now. It's yeah. a new option. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and w I, what about the role of of music in this mystical experience? Like, how have your thoughts evolved on that since your time at Hopkins? Because I think about the Hopkins playlist, the original, a lot. I got to tell you, I don't like it, and <laughs> and. I and that's sort of a lot of the reasons why I made my first music for mushrooms album because it was sort of like well I'm not just going to complain I'll I'll make my own version and I'll just offer that and we need lots of flavors of ice cream out there in the world it's all good whatever works but I'm curious um since you were there with that and some time has passed if you have any personal feelings about music and its role Yeah I'm first of all I'm so glad we had music 
I mean, can you imagine if someone had? I, I can't. No, role? I can't. Yeah. I can't. Yeah. That would be almost like you guys are crazy. But. Yeah, torturous. Um, when I was at Hopkins, listening to that soundtrack every day, and it was connected up with these very meaningful human relationships and interactions, my brain for that time period allowed that music to occupy that space of awe and transcendence. Once I left, there were a couple songs that stayed with me, but now, I mean, maybe you could pay me to listen to the whole thing again, but I don't think I would ever choose it on any kind of dose of anything. Um, now, I think the idea is correct, and it's very hard to come up with music that works for everybody. So I think Bill Richards and Helen Bonney, who was the original person who kind of came up with this music playlist, what they were trying to find is something that could speak to everybody. And everybody, meaning mostly Western people who were used to listening to classical music. Um, I don't, you know, I don't mind the opera. I kind of like opera music, but a friend of mine who's actually in opera, he said it's very basic. <laughs> it's like, it's also very <laughs> square, like a lot of, uh, you know, like literally as far as like lack of syncopation in that like classical music and I need the bendingness and I need the flow, especially what I want is that improvisation, that sense of like, I mean, if anything, I mean, if I had to choose, I'd like put on certain jazz pieces uh, over classical, but anyway. So what do you think of, have you heard the um, the Indian pieces, the like Hindi pieces that are more like- Yeah, like um, a raga, that, I mean, that's yeah. just killer. That's killer. That's some of, so it's not like flat out bad, but I had this whole thing against, or thinking about what are the advantages of, obviously bespoke music that's written for this longer form, one artistic voice, sort of how it's been done in human history versus a lot of smaller songs by different artists being used essentially off label. They might work fine, but what if? And it's sort of the unknown for a lot of us where it's like, well, we just haven't experienced it. And then, but when you do, there's a connectedness there of the journey that I think is really, really powerful. Well, certainly something that I, there was a, let's see, there was a, like an ethos or a philosophy at Hopkins that you didn't want music with vocals, or if they were vocals, they had to be language that you didn't understand. Yeah. Um, my own experiences after I left Hopkins, I would say, and this is throughout the book, that the times where the music had meaning or that were being sung by a live human being were completely life transforming for me. And if you look across how mushrooms are given to people, ayahuasca is given to people. Um, I, I don't know much about the peyote or the wachuma ceremonies, but you have a live human being <laughs> producing sound, whether it's through instruments or their voice, and that that is the key. That's the connection with the medicine. Yeah. And so in a way we kind of, I think we misunderstood what the point of the music was. We thought it was just there to kind of catch people as like a safety net, like help them go through these difficult experiences where meanwhile, there's actually a prescription. There's a language, there's a, an intelligent way of connecting sound to these medicines that I think we are just completely missing in the clinical model. And it could be just because people don't know, they don't know how to sing. They don't know the songs. They don't know the prayers to say. They don't know... You know, we're trying to limit how much the therapist gets in the way of someone's experience. But traditional healers would say that that's mm -hmm. missing the point, right? Yes. And I've heard from some traditional healers saying things like the song is actually what's calling forth the spirit of the medicine. It's like without that, we, it wouldn't happen. It doesn't work. And these songs have been developed over potentially centuries, millennia, who knows, as a technology it's part and parcel with the guidance of the experience and that's why it just blows my mind that it's not more of a central conversation i understand it's very difficult to quantify or even qualify music and pin it down for any kind of study i get it but it's also like to me there's like a third piece of this triangle that we're not giving enough credence to or thinking well, about I think potentially the scientists and the medical doctors want to believe that none of that matters because it's complicated. And 
for better or for worse, they are going to try everything they can to not have to address that complexity until they have to. So if they can get by with 20% uh, adverse events, that sounds like a lot, but they're like, oh, well, it's not 30%. It's not 40%. So we're, <laughs> we're, willing, to, we're willing to give up 20% of people having a bad experience because they didn't have a shaman in the room. They didn't have the right music. They didn't have the songs. They didn't have the prayers. Well, thank God, we still got 70% having, 70 or 80% having a good outcome. And now we don't have to figure that confusing part out. But as I said to someone, it's like, um, you know, it's like offering the communion wafer without any of the prayers that turn it into the body of Christ. Yeah, the, like, the ritual, the ceremony. Right, it's the ritual, like the ceremony, the prayers. You can't just pretend to be a Catholic priest. And you talk about this, like the ceremony is, it's it's set and setting in a sense, but it's like the role that this plays, it's, it's not like, for instance, hey, you have you have music. Well, it's like, no, but what kind of music and how is the music put out there? Even like the quality of the actual music coming out and the room itself, like these things matter tremendously. Right. Uh, but it really feels like, this is just from my own experience. Like that music is some kind of it's like a bridge or a translator to other dimensional, unseen, unspeakable, non dualistic spaces and meaning. And in those non dualistic spaces, we can't just speak or draw a picture to explain them, right? We always try and you're like, I figured it out and then you look at it later and it's just a circle. And you're like, but that was the answer. <laughs> and it made total sense in meaning and feeling. It's about feeling. And, but you know, you could play that a song in that space and it, it's helping you navigate and be in this kind of architecture of feeling and understanding. And then you come back into this three dimensional space and you can listen to the same song, the same exact recording. And it still has a kind of meaning to you. And that's what I mean about it being a sort of like portal in a sense or, or a thread that you can follow. And, that's very metaphysical or esoteric, but I've experienced it so many times that it feels like a deep kind of technology. Because then I start thinking, like, why do we even have music or what is music? Or why does it elicit such an emotional response? And we take it for granted is it because it's so present in our lives. But it really, because it's so present, it really makes me wonder, like, what could we unlock here? And wow. maybe I, as you're you know, talking to, I'm just allowing myself to think about. Like every meaningful experience, whether it, I, it actually made it into my book or not, included music, every mm. single one. So even the Buddhist retreat that I went on included chanting every morning. That's what that's you do as soon school, as you wake right? up. <laughs> yeah, that's it right there. Yeah, and it's like producing, both producing and receiving sound, somehow, I get what you're saying, it, like it, it goes through those layers. And people think I'm also a little bit, you know, when I talk about, um, I really don't mean this. I mean this in such fondness, but like functional psychosis, like you can experience something that if it was dysfunctional, you would be labeled psychotic or crazy or insane. But I think there are a lot of us who get really creative and are very connected into these other realms that we just learn to not talk about some of the psychotic stuff, right? Because it's like, we don't, we don't want to like scare people, but we can function. And so there are countless times when people who've died, experiences I've had, medicines I've never even ingested, but have just invoked their name by saying out loud, I would like to do this. Suddenly they are communicating with me through sound, through music. You know, you sound a wow. bit like a an insane person when you say that, like, what do you mean a song came on the radio and that was Iboga? I'm like, I don't know. That's just what it was. I don't know how to say it better than that. <laughs> it's it, like forms of synchronicity as ways of breaking through the spell of just like normality. That's it. So I was trying to explain to a very normal, lovely, intellectual, interested person about synchronicity. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And I started to try to come up with examples and they're like, clearly not impressed. They're like, eh, coincidence. <laughs> eh, you were just looking for that. And I was like, all right, I don't have to convince you. You can stay brainwashed. It's like really not a big deal to me. Mm. But to me, it feels like I got the opportunity to wake up through these little messages that got through the, the noise. 
you're touching on something here about synchronicity that I think is really interesting. It's like, it's a choice. Like, and and that's not good or bad. Like, you get to choose. Now, does that have meaning to me, that thing that's interesting that just happened? Or what do I want to choose to say it's pure coincidence has no meaning? And neither is right or wrong. But it's sort of like, look, one has a doorway to A, more fun, but <laughs> potentially the unknown. And and that's, I think, important to touch on is that these things are up to you and you can, you decide like if that's meaningful and some people don't, you know, my, I've had things, I think a lot of us have had things that have happened to us. It, it seems to be when you start to decide that these are meaningful, they happen in louder, more fantastical ways. Uh, and I've had instances where they get so loud there. If you didn't accept that gift of, perfunctoriness or whatever it is it's almost you know it's disrespect it's rude he's <laughs> cause it's like wow that was so crazy what just happened here but even small things like my dad and i i remember one time a rainbow was in the sky and i said dad look at that that's just fucking nuts that that happens that just happens that's part of earth and he's like yeah yeah the sun refracts in the refracts in the the rain and that's what, that's what he explained it. And I was like, well, explanation is not the same as justification. Or like, you know, right. And, and that's the way it is. And I love that that's part of the human experience though, too. Right. Because that to me is the soul's journey in a sense. It's like you get to choose and everybody graduates, but we have all the time in the world in a way. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I it's love it good. too. Cause I, like I told you, I'm now teaching middle and high school math. And half the time I'm just trying to help these kids feel that little glimmer of fun and magic in something that is totally not practical. It's simply beautiful. It's like math is just beautiful. It's another language for understanding reality. And it really doesn't matter to me how much of this you remember. It's how you feel while you're doing it. Like, can you break out of this, like you said, this spell by seeing a certain equation in a certain way and, mm -hmm. or a rainbow in a certain way, or can I teach you how to, Notice the part of your mind that wants to tell you you're bad at doing this thing. Just notice it. Don't change it. You don't have to feel bad about it. Just notice it for one minute and be like, wow, that's weird. Why am I talking to myself like that? Like, Yeah. Yeah. It, it, man, that's got to be wild. A trip like middle schools are probably like, first off, they're like, look, I've had an iPhone since I was an infant and it does all of this. This I don't need to know this. Um and I love this idea of like, it's a gateway into understanding sort of like the bones of like, cause music, it's just math really. So right. I mean, if you just have an understanding of that, you're like, Whoa, wait a minute. Like, it's just balance of ratios. It's like, that's all it is across time rhythm. And then we get into the whole, the trippy stuff. Like, why does that make me feel all sorts of different ways? That's crazy, <laughs> you know? And then you well, take so mushrooms to... and you're like, what? Wait, why is all this happening? And this is so funny because I had, um, I went back for my 10 year reunion at Dartmouth. So Dartmouth was where I first had my experience with MDMA for the first time. Um, mushrooms. Sounds like a lot of experiences according to this yeah, book here. I know, yeah, which is you why Dartmouth. It. I know yeah. Dartmouth doesn't want to give me the time of day now. They're like, this is not the, <laughs> this is not the PR we need. Thank you very much, you know. But um, I went back for my ten year reunion, and a friend of mine had brought some mushrooms, and the you know it was like a reunion party, so everyone's getting trashed. You know, they're listening yeah. to all the like the frat music that we used to listen to, and you know we wait till the party dies down, and then he was like. Hey, like, you know, this is the time in the night where it's like midnight, everyone's like moving, moving on. So like, let's, let's take some mushrooms. And we were going to go into this chapel that's always open, but they closed the chapel. So oh. our little like Good Friday experiment like failed. So instead we, we wandered around and we suddenly discovered that they had built a new math building and it was open. And we, we just walked through this math building and I was like, I'm like, right. You know, sometimes you try to write notes so you don't forget. And I just wrote math is God. That's well, it. <laughs> like I figured it all out, guys. Yeah. Like, and also, yeah. I think the mushrooms think that that's funny, right? That it's like the mushrooms are teaching us. Like, I feel like I'm teaching these these kids like the mushrooms just want us to have that glimmer. Right. I think they do. 
And they're like, sure, do whatever you want. You don't have to, but it's like, it's more fun and magical if you accept the glimmer, if you accept the doorway, but you don't have to, it's cool. Yeah, it's true. And that's kind of, it's an invitation and uh, it's okay not to go through that doorway, but I don't know. I just, I think you have a really interesting vantage point because when you're in a, such a, such a place like Hopkins or, or, or even Dartmouth, anywhere where it's like so powerfully rational, you know, and a lot of smart people and you're, and on top of that, it's about like trying to uh, understand things through studies and numbers and, and try to put it in a box. And I know a lot of researchers that I've talked to who've worked in this space, it, they've been inspired by their own mystical experiences. And so I guess, did you find a friction there with people or even in yourself about like, we're trying to study the ineffable or we're trying to pin something down. Is, is there a point to that or. So I certainly felt, I think I felt a conflict within myself and what I felt from my colleagues, not Roland or Matt or Mary, but like the, the greater colleagues at Hopkins was like a, I don't think they thought we were very smart. Yeah, like, a lot of derision we, for like, yeah, you know. and just, you know, but like, once you realize that that's just their need to make the world a predictable place, like, oh, whatever these people are saying has to either be wrong or kind of dumb until we decide that it's part of the smart science, which they've now decided, interestingly enough, right, with the right <laughs> yeah, nice. press tag and the right, like, PR, then like, <laughs> oh, certainly, like, mm-hmm. come on in, guys. But at the time, it was actually kind of a like a a cloak like sure just think i'm like a kind of wacky person from california who studied meditation i know i'm smarter than all of you and i know that i'm thinking about something that 50 years from now people are going to accept as just you know like that's just how things are i can't believe we ever thought differently um but as you can hear in my voice it's like to go into a place where you're feeling that conflict where you're like oh i have to be this way but i know i'm really this way for me was unsustainable. Um, And I'm sure there are other researchers and doctors who don't feel that conflict. Um, But it seems like the people who are asking the right questions, the ethical questions, the questions about the intelligence of the music or the plant medicine, they're having conflict still. You know, it's like you have to kind of separate out the issues if you don't want to feel that constant questioning. Yeah. Um, There are also researchers who've never had psychedelic experiences. How crazy is that? Why would you study this if you've never done it? There's people who are taking training programs to guide journeys who've never done it either. And I'm not saying like anyone has to do anything, but I'm also like, I just don't know how you could have any sort of sense of what they're going through. Like you talked about, you see a psychosis episode and I've met people who had the craziest things going on externally where things where I was very concerned for hours, you know, and the next day they're like, I'm like gently coming up to them. Like, how are you? You know, like, how's your head, you know, like, and how's your arm? Cause and he's, Oh, I feel great. I feel great. I'm like, well, how was that journey for you? Oh, it's amazing. I'm like, what do, you, what do you remember? And they're like, well, I don't know. I was just in the room doing my thing. And I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> like, so I've learned a lot of lessons about internal versus external experiences. And it's hard to imagine not having some semblance of what that could be like. Yeah, I just, I can't imagine being interested in psychedelics and A, not wanting to try it or B, like actively trying not to try it. Like it's, it's quite hard now to like actively say no, like, no, thank you. I don't want any psychedelic experiences. Like you have to go out (laughs) of your way now to like be a just say no person. And you're like, you're studying this every day and you're not even curious. Yeah. Like, so in a sense, I feel like maybe that's also part of the joke the psychedelics are telling. They're like, they're pointing out all of these inconsistencies. They're like, what do you mean? You, is it scary <laughs> to be that curious? Like, what are you afraid of? Like, what's going to happen? <laughs> so what, what do you think um, are some of the blind spots we might have right now in, in this, this happening and like sort of things we could be doing or aren't, aren't doing that maybe we could bring forth into the conversation? Well, I think 
so some of the blind spots, and I know this from talking to people who got really um, dependent on, or I, I mean, addicted is not the right word, but really hooked into certain tryptamines, for example, like DMT, especially if you smoke it. I think there's a potential for dependence with psychedelics that if you're a psychonaut and that's how you want to spend every day of your life, like go for it, you know, like just please don't wind up in jail, you know, like be safe. But I think the general public has no interest in taking psychedelics all the time. And so maybe one blind spot is what happens when we treat someone for depression and then they want to use this all the time? Like, how do That's we... That's got to be rare though, isn't it? I mean... we I guess we don't know. So mm -hmm. I would... I If I were a doctor prescribing this, I would want to know what that percent is. Is it 5%? Is it 1%? Mm -hmm. Um, well, with ketamine, it's a quite high percentage. I was going to bring up ketamine, yeah. So, like, yeah. we're learning kind of too, you know, just a bit too late that ketamine is really great, but it's like, oh wait, now people can't stop. So, like, what have we done? What have we introduced people to? And is this lifestyle of taking a psychedelic all the time what they signed up for? You know, I think these are mm. we could ask these questions about MDMA and psilocybin now. So maybe we have that information we can tell people like, hey, you have to decide, is your PTSD so bad that you don't want to be alive anymore, but you might end up being hooked on MDMA every year for the rest of your life? Like, are you okay with that choice? Really hard question to answer if you've never had MDMA. Um, right. And I bring up MDMA because I think other than ketamine, it's the only other psychedelic that has the risk of abuse. So in college, I overdid MDMA and it really was not good for my brain. Like I could literally feel my, I mean, I know this is like classic dare propaganda, but I could feel my neurons like firing and exploding. <laughs> like it's like there's a certain amount. <laughs> well, that's MDMA, not... is, I don't think is a real free pass there. Like you can feel, you feel it. It, it doesn't feel like that's very clean on your body. Like in no. say the way psilocybin, you can sometimes wake up and feel better. Uh, yep. But MDMA from what I've heard, is not very good for you physically. And you, you don't want to be doing that very often. But of course, it can feel so good in the moment, but there can be such a depletion afterwards. But right. at the same time, as far as like going back to what you said about if you were to tell someone who has extreme PST, PTSD, you might have to continue with this medicine. I, I, I don't think it would be nearly as often as taking like... Uh, you know, antipsychotics or antidepressants every day, and and they kind of told who knows that can take on your body. Whereas I would hope some of these experiences, even if it's ketamine therapy, would be once a week at the most. You know, maybe, but right. But you're right. There's a lot to be learned there. But I think the the goal would be that uh, they're helping you affect some kind of change, not just chemically, which they seem to be. But there's this spiritual aspect that to me seems to have a lot to do with the healing in, in addition with addiction and stuff. It's not just like it's helping you chemically. Have right. you found that too? Like, And that's the role like ceremony in a sense helps with. It's like to, to allow that part of the experience in and say this is very valuable. Like your understandings, you, you might choose to do things differently and just have more of a motivation to do it. Yeah, I mean, I think the best thing that could probably come out of someone approaching these medicines for a clinical reason, and then the they experience relief, so their basic symptoms become less, as the clinical research shows. Maybe that doesn't last very long. Maybe it lasts a few months, maybe six months. Maybe they need a few years of taking, you know, three or four times a year kind of thing with yeah. MDMA or psilocybin, which would be kind of a lot, but not unheard of in psychonaut circles. And ideally, what I would love for people is that they get through that kind of initiation period. And I think when you stop experiencing intense, severe distress, then you can finally start building something, right? Growing in a way that then that's where the spiritual journey, I think, really takes off. So in a way, it's like what we call health is just the starting point. And the lack of health, the lack of ease, the lack of feeling at home in your body, it's like we're, people are starting from like negative 10 and now we got to get them to zero and then they can start building a life out of this new reality. So I'm excited for all those people who will get to the starting point and then hopefully there will be a lot more communities and awesome people to help them in a non-medical way. But I appreciate that like the medical side 
often has to be addressed first. And maybe sure. that's the, you know, maybe that's a, um, maybe that's a role that some of these companies are playing, right? It's like, I'm not interested in helping people who are really sick get better first. I'm interested in having these spiritual conversations and like helping people achieve their absolute potential. But how are they going to do that if they don't want to get out of bed in the morning, if they have, they can't sleep because they've got nightmares, you know? So that's, I can see that that's like the medical people's purview. And, you know, in terms of blind spots, maybe just the medical people would do well to maybe accept their limitations. Like they're not spiritual authorities. Most of them don't understand what is going on, but like we can get people pretty well. We can help people get healthier. Like that's our role. That's how we'll use the medicine and then we'll do the handoff, you know? Mm -hmm. It's almost like you're saying the baseline is when the spiritual work starts and the spiritual work, another way of looking at it is like reality. It's like walking your walk, doing life with a kind of grace and ease is the ideal as opposed to then it goes into some airy, non-physical space. It's like, no, 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 no. The spiritual is, is, is doing the dishes with gratitude in a sense or like being at peace, uh, peace of mind really is all I'm I, looking for. Yeah. It also kind of reminds me of some of the conversations in the Buddhist community when it came to the West, right? It's like people were first trying to get high like blissed out, enlightened, transcend all the problems. And then a lot of people realize like, oh no, this is a practice that is allowing me to live my life with greater ease, with more compassion, with easier forgiveness of myself and others. So if you tell people that meditation will help them with those very mundane things, I mean, who's going to meditate? That sounds pretty boring. <laughs> so you hook them with the bliss and the enlightenment, you know, and then that gets them over that threshold. And I think maybe with psychedelics, we're hooking a lot of people with that same false promise for better or for worse. And mm. so once they're hooked, because they think they're going to get, you know, they're going to be miraculously cured, then then they're on the other side of that. They're like, oh, actually, I'm just kind of really enjoying my life. What a, what a gift. Like, I didn't know that just my normal life could feel this good. And maybe dealing with stress better, perhaps, yeah. or sort of like not getting so wrapped up in the, in your story or change is slightly more, it's still stressful, but it's not like the world ends, you know? So it's a kind of resiliency or fortitude, an inner mm -hmm. fortitude maybe. Yeah. What do you think is the, the future uh, for this work or what is your, your hope for it? Um, well, so first of all, my hope is that it will be possible for most of us to legally acquire the chemicals and substances we want without having to pay a lot of money for it or hang out with people we don't like. And I know that sounds like such a low bar, but I feel like we might forget that very practical matter in search of some kind of greater good. You know, it's like, oh, mm. well, we're all just going to accept that I can't go to a boutique shop and get MDMA that's been quality tested and is legal. I'm just going to have to pretend I have a diagnosis and go to a doctor and get a prescription and do it in a clinic. Like, no, like, let's just skip all of that charade. You know, I'm glad it's there for the people who need it, but most of us are never going to want that for our drugs. Like, do you, I like, I like being able to go to the pharmacy and get what I need when I'm sick. And I know I can't get everything I need when I'm sick, but I'm like still one of those people who's annoyed that they got rid of Sudafed. <laughs> like Sudafed really works when you're, when you have a really congested nose and instead they put it behind the counter and just putting a drug behind the counter, like that annoys me. So like I have this silly vision that we will be able to buy and use the drugs we want in the way that we want without having to pretend to work through this system that's very contrived. So that may be a fantasy that never pans out, but I just, ha I have to keep saying it out loud because yeah. I've said things out loud that mm -hmm. come to pass. So mm -hmm. I've asked my um, Vermont legislators if they would consider having a public supply of quality GMP MDMA that like every Vermont resident gets like two a year. Like wow. I just put it out there because I was like, why not? Like we're at the point where we're deciding what the laws can be and the laws are all made up anyway. So like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> and again, I keep saying it out loud so that people realize it's not actually that complicated. If you're not looking to profit from this stuff, it's not complex. 
It's actually very straightforward. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one one vision of mine that not all the MDMA will be hard to get. <laughs> the I think the second vision is that um, more people will learn to love their life and not choose harm and violence before the greater forces that are choosing harm and violence overtake everything. And I know that's a very lofty goal, but it's like, I think if enough of us on an individual level could take that vow of reducing harm and not committing violence, eventually maybe all of those collective choices will be more than what seem like insurmountable opposition, like these huge forces of violence and harm and, you know, these forces that want to control people, tell them what to believe, what to hope for, what not to hope for, that each of us on an individual level, and I think this is where psychedelics are the most powerful, can choose like, hey, we're not going to just give in to the brainwashing. We're not just going to get in, give in to what you're telling us, that wars are inevitable, that violence is always what humans do. It's like, no, we're not going to do that anymore. And again, Free MDMA and no <laughs> war seem like, like, come on, Catherine. That's like, a party. This is my yeah. fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I asked for it, so thank you. Yeah. And and what do you think is the future of music in this space? Um, I think in a very short time from now, all of the psychedelic therapists will be taught how to sing the right songs. Wow. It's not going to take very long because they're going to realize what works and what doesn't. And even me, so I don't sit for people. I have two little kids. I'm a math teacher. Like I've got other stuff going on. But I told myself recently that if one day I did ever sit for people again, especially with mushrooms, I would learn the songs and I would learn how to sing and I would learn how to do do it right. And if I don't have the time to invest in learning how to do it right, I'm not I'm not ready to do it yet. Um so again, I put that out there so that maybe people are thinking and they're like, oh, well, I know some songs I can sing. Like, I can learn this language. I can learn this prayer. Like, it's not that hard. Just, you know, find the people who know the songs now. Write so them down and learn you're them. you're speaking to a lineage of songs in traditions that work with mushrooms. I think specifically, and it, that part is a little tricky, right? Because they were all kind of made up. And nobody wrote them down. But Maria Sabina did mm-hmm. write some of them down through a translator. Mm-hmm. But there are very few people who know the Nahuatl songs. Um, I can think of a handful right. of people I've met who know them. And and then there's the whole aspect of like mushrooms are all over the world. It's like there might be many traditions that have come and gone. And if anything, that's why I start to think like what if you, it's just about maybe it's just about you singing too and making your own songs. Ooh, I like that. Because essentially that's what's always been done. It's just sort of right. keep developing it. And I that's the mushroom too. I mean, it's all source coming through. So it's just sound. It's just love. It's just music emanating from one human being to another. I also think about like participants being invited to chant or sing or hum and have that kind of sound coming out of them be welcomed as part of the experience and what that might bring. I can't remember if I told you this when we first spoke, but I had maybe two or three participants in the Hopkins trials who started chanting or like what's classically called speaking in tongues. Like it sounds like gibberish. I've also seen it happen with a couple friends on high doses of mushrooms where like the sound demands to be expressed and they have no control over it, but it comes out in a very like alien kind of language. So I've witnessed this a handful of times, both at Hopkins and anecdotally yeah. so i think you're kind of onto something there well you know the old terence mckenna uh when he's with his brother originally and they were the glossolalia they were this is what they're getting really into was like these tones and they get into super high dose psychedelics and the sounds they were making in the language i mean you talk about studies i'm like if we could record hundreds of those and then have linguistics you know people who understand this like study it is there anything do you see patterns you know is wow. can we is there a language here? Is there any or not? Or is it a musicologist? Is like, is there something going on with across these people with melody coming through? Or I would be Ta- fascinated. I think, thank God Fred Barrett is the new director now, right? And like this legacy of this interest in music and mushrooms can continue. But before we end, I do want to just mention, because I learned this recently, 
and it's documented many places. You just kind of have to look for, you know, where to find it. So when Maria Sabina first connected with the mushrooms at a very, very high dose, she took a very high dose to cure herself of some chronic pain that she was having that wouldn't go away. And she said when she crossed that like super high dose threshold, she was given this like book, like a literal book from the spirit realm that had a whole language in it. And she said at that high dose, she memorized the entire book in one night. And that's how she came up with the songs. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Whoa. So I want to know about that book. Yeah. Yeah. That's and the ultimate was that song just book. Her, was that just her version of this, you know, universal thing? Or is that like the mushrooms are like, no, no, no we've got a book. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah. Well, that definitely goes into the category of a synchronicity that she chose to say yes to. I mean, you, uh, you could also look at that and be like, oh, that was just some book that came to me and that's nothing. <laughs> I mean, that's incredible. Just incredible. I mean, I, I feel like the, my conversation with the mushrooms through music has just been, you know, like drip, drip over years and years and years. I'm like, what, I don't know what these things are that come through, but what a trip it would be to have in one session, just like, here it is. <laughs> Start studying. You <laughs> I know? know, right? That's so wild. I haven't heard that before. I have a, a friend, Santiago, uh, who's, in, who's Mexican. He's in, he's a really talented director and he's working on a beautiful film about her and so oh. i've learned a little bit about her from him and it's a tragic story i mean it's a powerful yeah. story uh but he's a real artistic filmmaker so i mean i'm i can't wait to see what he puts together here with this film from someone in mexico so oh i'm super excited about that yeah yeah and i'm working on, i've been working on a documentary for a few years about music and mushrooms so i mean that's why i'm so interested in the subject and talking a lot about it and thinking a lot about it lately because it's I'm just curious where it could go and and partially on the study part but partially just for the people because I can't think of a more democratized tool as far as like hey you want to guide journeys and not everyone can go to a therapy session or go overseas it's like but they can probably press play on an album if it's on YouTube or something and it can maybe guide them through and maybe that can be the baseline, like that could be enough, you know? Well, I mean, some of the later chapters in my book are that exact model. So I don't have it totally pinned down. I don't know how it would work for, you know, a stranger, but my friend basically said, here's the playlist. It's, it has all of my intention in it. It's got the intention of the, at the time she was, good friends with uh, John Hopkins before he kind of became famous. So it had a lot of his music in the playlist and it was literally that it's like, I knew the MDMA protocol. I knew I had created my spiritual room, my altar. I pressed play and I just trusted that this playlist would yeah. take me through this particular intention. And it not only did that, but it's like, it completely aligned me with my deeper intention, which I thought was impossible before that night. So it's like, how did her playlist at that time with that dose, you know, with all of the possible factors, how did that happen? It's a total miracle. I choose to see it that way. There you go. <laughs> That's it. Was that, yeah. Is that Rosalind Watts? Was that who put that playlist together? Uh, no, it was my friend Eileen Hall. So Eileen also I did know the cover. I know Eileen. Yeah, yeah. So Eileen did the cover art for my book. And, oh, okay. um, Eileen was sending, creating and sending playlists out to a lot of women in her life. It was, um, it wasn't even a, co it wasn't even a COVID thing. It was just that she was friends with a lot of people all over the world and it was hard to see each other. So she'd be like, here, I came up with this playlist and she'd name them after each person. So like I had my own Aww. playlist and like, which is also kind of an amazing thing to build on that sense of like personal meaning that if the playlist is named for you. Like it could be the same songs as somebody else got, right? But it's like you receive this intelligent, wise packet of information and it's like, this is you. This is your special delivery. Like press play. <laughs> <laughs> what do you what do you hope people take away from your book, Midnight Water? I hope they remember that everything they want for themselves is possible. And absolutely nobody is standing in your way. 
any point you feel that you need to have this person do this thing or this other person allow you to do this or this thing to be resolved, it's everything that you think is out there is actually within you. And as soon as you accept the, the locus of that control within yourself, then all the doors open. And maybe they open one at a time, but if you keep expecting that the thing outside is what needs to change, you will just keep banging your head against a closed door. Sort of like you're saying, the, the, the way out is in. That's something I've heard before. <laughs> I love it. The way out is in. <laughs> That's beautiful. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for taking the time. It's good to see you again. It's great to see you. And thank you for creating music. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll hit stop on that guy there.